All right. Well, welcome to Iowa Ideas in Depth Week. Uh, this week's focus is on issues facing rural Iowa, and the name of today's session is New Idea to Action. I'm Tom Barton. I'm the Gazette's uh, Deputy Des Moines Bureau Chief covering Iowa politics, including the Iowa legislature and campaigns. And um, I'll serve as your moderator, helping to guide today's discussion and conversations as part of Iowa Ideas, which seeks to explore the issues, address challenges, and share the big ideas that will shape the future of Iowa. Um, I'd like to recognize our presenting sponsor, ITC Midwest, uh, which helps make this virtual conference possible. Um, a reminder that audience members can submit questions in the Q&A at the bottom. Um, and if you have questions about ideas that you might have for your small community and would like the panelists maybe to weigh in and talk about, you know, how do I move forward with this idea? What are some of the next steps? What are your thoughts on this? You know, please, um, we, we welcome those questions. Um, you can put those in the chat in the, the, the Q&A at the bottom. All right. So on the docket today, how can you build support for a new idea and help open minds to it? And how can you harness the power to get new volunteers into the fold? So we have with us uh, Deb Brown and Becky McRae of Save Your Town. Uh, they work with communities uh, in Iowa and beyond on these questions. Um, welcome to you both. Thank you for being here and agreeing to share your perspective on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So a quick introduction and a setup for today's discussion. Rural America has been shrinking for decades, and the Great Recession accelerated that contraction as rural manufacturing jobs disappeared, schools closed, farms consolidated, people moved to cities and suburbs, and rural areas saw fewer births and more deaths. Um, in 1900, almost three-fourths of Iowa's population lived on farms in small towns. By 2010, only 36% of Iowans remained in rural areas, and 69 of Iowa's 99 counties recorded population loss between 2010 and 2020, according to census data. Um, the hard truth here is that most small towns will never gain population again. That's why some have termed their focus from growing numbers to growing quality of life. Uh, Iowa State University uh, researchers have found, among other factors, social infrastructure plays a major role in whether residents report greater quality of life, and that rather than looking outward, trying to lure more families and employers to these sparsely populated rural areas, communities have a greater shot at success by building a stronger identity and sense of belonging in a community. Um, Deb and Becky joined forces in May 2015. Um, to help small towns and rural communities thrive, again, launching Save Your Town, which believes that small towns can be saved by their own people using their own resources, um, and the pairs specialize in helping communities identify and implement low or no-cost solutions that um, can work in even uh, the tiniest of towns. Um, again, welcome to both of you. Um, Deb, let's, let's start with you. Um, tell me a little bit about your background and how you came to get involved in this work. Well, I actually grew up in Iowa um, on a farm outside Geneva, 141 people, definitely a small town. And like many of uh, kids my age, I moved away to a big city and eventually ended up in North Carolina. When my dad had a heart attack, it was time to move back home. Again, another common thing we see in small towns. After I got here, I spent 10 years in the Chamber of Commerce workforce with the last four as director of the commerce in Webster City, Iowa. Great. Um, and um, Becky, we'll, we'll move on to you. Um, tell me a little bit about um, how your background and how you got involved in this work. Absolutely. I am from Oklahoma. My husband and I are cattle ranchers here. And I we both graduated high school here and have been involved in lots of government work, nonprofit work. Spent over a decade running a retail store in my nearest big town of Alva, which is about 4,000 people. 
Um, and when I started with that retail store, that was about 2006. I also started blogging and joined Twitter. So that gave me exposure to the wider world of rural people all over. So I spent a lot of time traveling and speaking and sharing about rural communities, starting with how we could use social media marketing. And it has expanded from there into more rural revitalization things. And then that brings us up to how we started together. Right. So um, tell me a little bit about that. Um, where did the idea of Save Your Town come from and how did you get started? What's kind of the purpose mission behind the effort? Well, Becky and I actually met on Twitter first back in 2008. And then she invited me on a blogger's tour in Hutchinson, Kansas, a year later. Now, we have had there was and still is a mutual respect and love for small towns for, from both of us during uh 2009 to 13, we held events together showcasing small towns and our paths crossed. And we talked about using social media and making a difference in rural. Um, Becky came to my town for a visit and we decided to do something together specifically for small towns. And of course, we started small part time around our current schedules. And then in 2017, I made the decision that I'm just going to do this work with Becky full time. Um, and Becky, talk about next, you know, how, how, what's our purpose and mission? Because you cover that so well. Well, um, Tom's already mentioned that we believe small towns can be saved by their own people using their own resources. This is a little bit of an outsider's perspective from the common rural development approach. And we do specialize in solutions that people can put into action without spending a lot of money. And we always try to make sure that an idea will work in a town that is under a thousand or even under a hundred, like the one I live in, which is 33 people. And so the ideas that we share are things like the tour of empty buildings, which Deb invented there in Iowa, um, our economic our empty lot economic development. And then um, we kind of got a lot of attention also for the cheap downtown place making ideas because small town and rural people know that we have to be cheap to make things work. So that's one of our famous ideas. And then besides things that we offer on our website, which is videos and audios, we also have detailed toolkits and checklists that walk people through processes of making things happen. And then we both travel, we deliver keynotes and workshops. We do idea-friendly action visits. Deb is known for spending three and four days in a community, getting to know everyone, learning what they need and helping them find ways to move that forward. And she also does coaching to help people move forward with their ideas. Uh, and, and what is the, the website that you mentioned? save your dot town so we're one of the few dot town addresses we were one of the first um and picked that up in 2015 save your dot town great and and why why save save your town why 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 go with that name this is deb's fault <laughs> i'm gonna take some of the blame for that so we were just chatting what should we call ourselves and it's not about us coming in to save a town. It's literally about the small town saving their own town. And because that dot town came up, save your dot town was just perfect. And it's about you, right? Like it's an instruction to you. You are going to save your town. We are not going to do it. This is something you are going to do. It will help, but we're not going to be the ones like saddling you with a big hundred page comprehensive plan with no funding. We're just going to make it easier to make your ideas happen. Yeah. So um, you guys have have been um, working in in this realm for um, I guess decades. I guess what 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 have you learned? What are some of the biggest challenges you're seeing and hearing from people in small towns, particularly in Iowa? So I want to touch on this because it's important. Since 2015, we have actually asked rural people, what are their challenges? And we do that with the survey of rural challenges. And over 1,700 people have participated. Iowa's results are pretty similar to the overall results. We face many of the same challenges as other rural communities. And that makes sense to me. Um, I'll tell you, when asked about their town's future, rural people are twice as likely to say that they were optimistic as opposed to pessimistic. Now, the top community challenges are lack of housing, inactive downtowns, population losses, and lack of childcare. 
It wasn't poverty, crime, or drug abuse. Those actually rank low. And that was that was actually true on every time we've run the survey since 2015. We also have a section on the survey for rural businesses to share their challenges. And their top challenges are workforce, finding workers, um, also finding support services that they need, and finding usable buildings along with um, increasing online competition and difficulty in marketing. But it wasn't um, people saying, man, we need a lot more jobs, or businesses saying, man, we can't get a business loan. Those ranked low every time. And there were zero businesses who said, man, we really want a business plan pitch competition. <laughs> hmm. So I, I, I'm curious, what is driving that that optimism and, and how fragile is that optimism? And, and how do these small communities, I guess, maintain and build upon that? Well, we found that the most optimistic people were the people who were trying new ideas in their community and in their business. This was actually something I think that Deb first noticed in our data is she kept saying, oh, well, here's an idea that people have tried here and look at this. And, and um, this is business is trying a new promotional event or they've tried a new marketing idea or they're adapting to innovative marketing plans. And so that was interesting to me that there was a correlation between the optimism and whether they were trying things. And we are rural people, Tom. Um, we tend to always come back to being optimistic. We love our communities. The majority of us love our communities and it's hard not to be optimistic. And probably everyone listening to this, the type of people who were attracted to an event called Iowa Ideas are people who have some amount of optimism and hope for their community and want to try things. All right. Um, just a reminder that if you have uh, questions for our panelists, um, to submit those uh, in, in the Q&A or in the chat at the bottom, and uh, we will do our best to, to get as many as, as, as we can. Um, so, so I'm curious, um, we talked about this optimism, I guess, in doing your, your, your survey and, and, and the work that you do, what assets are these, do these small towns have to, to help them address some of these issues that, that you identified in, in the survey and, and challenges they face? And what are they doing to, to leverage those assets? Good question. Well, the top business assets, of course, are the people. Um, and those people are trying, like Becky said, they're trying the innovative ideas and the up-to-date marketing. Um, when you learn that you can do things with a small step, uh, the chance of failure, it's still there, but it's not such a big deal. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit later. But I also want to mention in Iowa, the top assets were natural resources, outdoor recreation, and believe and tourism. So many small rural communities have that. You don't need to have a lake, but you might have a walking trail. Um, you might have people that run an archery event. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons, but those top assets were the natural resources, outdoor recreation, and tourism. We had a number of comments of people just explaining that the reason they live in their community is that they love being part of the natural world and in a way that you can't do in a city that you are you have a, a closer connection to the natural world and that includes agriculture and all of the things that we're used to seeing in the surroundings in Iowa. You, you talked about um, in, innovative marketing are, are there some examples of that that you can you can provide? Deb, do you want to hit some of the innovative um, social media marketing kind of things that people do? Do you want me to hammer on that? Yeah, you start and I'll fill in where you missed off. How's that? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I remember in particular, there's one store and Deb, I'm pretty sure this is an Iowa story where the gal was doing, she started in the pandemic of doing virtual sessions in her store. She would take her phone and she would try on an outfit of clothing and she'd do a live stream of here's the outfit and here's the clothing. And this is what but all you're going to want to use as accessories. And she'd be like, okay, I'll be right back. And she'd set the phone down. She'd go change, put on another outfit. <laughs> she'd come back and go, okay, so here's this. And I'm going to show you all of this. And from that, she developed doing personalized sessions with people and started connecting with particular customer and going, oh, I know this is going to be perfect for you and showing them on video. And that's innovative marketing when you're not only sharing what you have in a new way, but making it so personal to the customer, it's definitely going to be something that people are far more likely to take action on. 
Absolutely. And Gowrie, Iowa, I just left there not too long ago. Um, they have a store that closes the doors at six and then they go online and they do live sessions about the things, the really cool things they have in their store. So they didn't exactly know what they were doing, but they wanted to try it. So one person talked and another one tried on clothes or went and got product. They just had a really good time with it. And they're finding customers that are actually purchasing their products now because they were willing to try an innovative marketing idea. Um, and you mentioned um, one of the biggest assets um, that these um, small and rural communities have is um, uh, their natural resources, the, the outdoors, outdoor recreation opportunities to, to, to connect with nature. Um, are there some examples there of, of communities that you know have really done well to, um, I guess, leverage that asset or to tap into that? So oh the first thing that comes to mind for me is Little Wall Lake outside of Jewel, Iowa. They've done an amazing job by partnering up with the county and making it possible to, to, to go there for an hour, to go there with your tent or to go and actually rent a cabin. So, and they're they're promoting not only in person, but they're promoting online too. So they're, they're doing a, a nice mix of things. So I guess, how do you support and, and open minds to, to some of these new ideas? Well, you know, you talked about that, that Iowa State University, you know, they did a 20 year long survey of 99 towns and all kinds of good and bad things ha happened over those 20 years. But the researchers found the ones that prospered were the ones who were open to new ideas and welcome newcomers into decision make into the decision making process. That's important. Um, out of that, that's just one example that Becky uses. She created the um, idea friendly method, and we're going to share a little bit about that. Absolutely, um, that idea of being open to new ideas, actually making a difference, and whether your town will prosper, is a big influence in how you approach your town, but for a lot of small town people, they feel like, well, that would be great, but there's nothing I can do about it. But there really is. There is a way that you can start with you and spread the openness to new ideas. So this is the idea friendly method. You start with whatever your big idea is for your community. It doesn't matter whether other people agree with you yet, or if you're the only one that harbors this dream, you gather your crowd by sharing that idea or dream in such a way that people can be attracted to you. And these are the ones who most want to work with you. So it's not about convincing people. It's just simply letting them be attracted if they like your idea. And then you turn that crowd of loosely associated people into a powerful network by building connections between them. And that is how you find the resources you need and the information you need to do what comes next, which is you and that powerful network are going to make the idea happen by taking small steps. You make it bite-sized enough that anyone can join in and then they can be attracted to what you are doing. And that is how you get people to be more open to your new idea is by allowing them to be attracted to you and spend a lot less time trying to convince people that it will work. So we have a, a, a question uh, from a, a, an audience member talking about um, mentioning the need to find ideas that are cheap to implement. Um, their question, so how have, um, how have, how have community or county foundations um, in in these small, sparsely populated um, communities, do, how have they helped with that? And do they have enough endowment to be uh, meaningful to, to fund these projects? It's not about whether they have a big enough endowment. Each community has about as much endowment as they have right now, right? <laughs> like that's the way it works. This is This is how much endowment you have and that's where you start and you build from there. And in fact, the best way to build that endowment to make a bigger impact down the line is by taking small steps, funding small but immediate wins that are going to bring more people to the concept of supporting the community foundation. And then you can leverage that into the future to grow your endowment, to continue to improve your community at the same time. And that's the way that we get from not having enough to make a huge impact to being a powerful force for good in our community. Deb, do you have a specific example you wanna 
thrown well, in? I, I do want to mention that um, when we think of uh, community foundation, I'm not thinking of $20,000 to fund an idea. I'm thinking of what can $500 do? What can $1,000 do for somebody's idea? Um, those are the kind of, of uh, funding that helps create murals that makes it possible to put murals in your downtown, just as a simple example. And I was doing a great business of putting murals on their, on different buildings downtown. Um, yeah, I Go get ahead. excited thinking about a thousand dollars to help any project. Okay, so um, I, I'm, I'm curious. So then I guess, if, if, if you live in these um, small communities, how do you go about then defining success? You know, population is still declining. You know, how do you call that successful? You know, does it become more of a subjective measure of success, like keeping the hardware store or the grocery store open or having two or three families move in? You, you talk about, you know, kind of these small scale wins. Why is that important and how does that help these rural communities? You can measure success so many ways that are not measured by population. You can measure success in terms of quality of life, and it is completely possible to measure quality of life. You look at that Iowa State University study uh, that's already published online. They show you several ways to go about measuring the quality of life, as well as being able to measure all of the different community capitals from bridging social capital to bonding social capital to all of those different things. Can we measure the the quality of our life and our, our social capitals. How are we improving as a community? You can measure the success of your community by happiness. You can create a happiness index. The nation of Bhutan has a national happiness index. Like we have gross national product, they measure their gross national happiness. And so that's another system that's already set up that you can go and get some inspiration from and go, are, are people happy to live here? Are we Have we made improvements in quality such that we can say our people are measurably more happy with their lives here in our community? You can also measure the success of your community using the donut economics model that is uh, created by Kate Raworth. And that one's another one that's online available. You can go and copy it. It's about, are we doing enough to meet the needs of our community? without overshooting the resources that we have? Are we following falling into the sweet spot of the donut of we're serving people's needs, but we're not overshooting the resources that we have as a community? So there's at least four different ways that you can measure the success of your community that are not just about population. And, and you know, it's little things, Tom, like you have one new vendor at the farmer's market. That's a success tell that story. The more successes that you have in small ways, it's important to tell the story because not everybody's heard it. Uh, you may think you have, you may think people have heard it, but they haven't. So just keep talking about the cool things that are happening that are making your community strong again and creating happiness. In fact, we're terrible at noticing all the good things that happen. And when Deb was a Chamber of Commerce director, she started a list. And every time a new business opened, she added them to the list. And people would come to her at the coffee shop and they would say, boy, there's nothing happening in this town. We can't get any good businesses going. There's just nothing good. And she'd be like, oh, really? And pull out the list. And she'd start telling them, all right, so here's this. Have you been by? Did you shop there? How about these guys? Have you stopped by to see the new tire store? Right? Like, that kind of, of focus on the negative is a natural human response. It's also the way that most of our news is reported. And so if you are the positive person in your town, or if you want to be the positive person in your town, start that success list. Milnor, North Dakota, um, they keep a success list of every business that has opened, every business that has reinvested in the community, every new community amenity that they have opened, everything they've done to improve the quality of life. They have a, a two-page handout of all the great stuff that has happened in the last 10 years. And you can find it in more than just the chamber office. It's everywhere. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like the first obstacle then is is trying to to, to, to change that mentality, right? And, and getting people to, um, I guess, accept that shrinking towns are, you know, not supposed to be seen as problematic or failing, but rather as a reality to, to be embraced and, and understood. And that, again, rather than looking outward and trying to lure more families and employers to these sparsely populated areas, that communities, again, 
having had this uh, greater shadow success by building stronger identity, sense of belonging. How do you get these communities to look inward as opposed to outward? Really, it's about looking at the new solutions, the new energy that come from new residents. And every town, every community has new residents. There's, we're used to the, the time period when high school students graduate and we have a big ceremony and we acknowledge that all these kids, a high percentage of them will move away. But over the course of a year, we have no corresponding ceremony where we say, have you noticed the five new families that have moved in? I told you I live in a town of 33 people. I used to say it was 30 people, but a new family has moved in up the road and they have a child. So that's three new people. <laughs> but if we aren't noticing the people that are moving in, because we just don't have that ceremony to acknowledge it. Now, one of the ways to best tap the energy that already exists in your community is to start listening to your young people. Everyone says they listen to their young people and no one really does it intensively, but there's a great project that was started by the Oklahoma State University Rural Scholars Program, where they sent college students who are in their junior and senior year into rural communities to be part of those communities for eight weeks at a time. Those scholars, one of the projects they did is called Photo Voice. They went to high school students within these very rural areas of Southwest Oklahoma, and they asked those students, what do you want in your community? What do you like that's here now? Where's a place you can make a difference? What do you wish you had in your community? And they gave them some basic photography training and turned them out upon their communities. And then those students came back with ideas. One of the ideas was, we'd really like to have a breakfast place or a donut shop. And they took a photo of an empty lot where a building used to be and say, maybe we could put a donut shop right here and have a breakfast place in town. Another group of students said what they really liked, they felt like their mural, there was a really nice modern mural in their town said, we feel like this is a cool part of our town, but we'd also like to be reflected here. So it's not that kids don't have ideas, it's that we're doing a poor job of asking our young people what they want to be part of and then here's the part that you have to do this is so essential you have to help them do their ideas it's not enough to say oh you want a breakfast shop that's cute no you need to say here's how you can get started go get some donated donuts from some place that sells donuts and talk them out of some low-cost donuts get a wagon load the donuts in the wagon make some big signs that say we need a donut shop come downtown to that empty lot and start handing out donuts to everybody in town. Go business to business if you need to and tell people, we'd really like to see a donut shop in town. Do you know anyone that could help us? Is there an empty building we could use? Is there some way that we can get started? So helping those kids make their ideas happen, even in that kind of a small way where they're starting something, is something that will generate new energy and ideas in your community. And that is where you get the energy to move forward in your community, looking at what you already have in your own resources. You know, Tom, I was in Mount Air doing some work. I was down there for an on-site visit um, in Ringgold County, and it was awesome. I had the opportunity to meet some um, families that had moved back with their kids. They wanted to come home to where they grew up to raise their kids in the environment they loved. And they meet together monthly, almost monthly if they can, to talk about their businesses and, and what kind of businesses they need and what can they do to get started on things. And they are opening new businesses and bringing more people in. So what was fascinating to me when I was giving my final presentation in a big setting, in a big room, um, I asked anybody that was under the age of 40 to please stand up. And about 12 of those kids in a room of 50 people stood up and I said, look around. Do you know these people are back in town? Well, of course, many didn't know they were back in town because they didn't hang out with them. They didn't know they were there. So, so doing something to bring attention to the people that are in town, like hosting a um, newcomers meeting or a newcomers gathering, have your real estate agents in personally invite new people in town to come to a meeting, give them some coffee and donuts and talk about why they're there and how you can help them and answer questions like, can you burn your garbage? Um, they did that in Bennettsville, South Carolina, and it's making a huge difference because you're bringing people together and we know community happens when people talk to each other. So you have to find ways to do that. 
Okay. So you've reached out to the community. You've gathered their input. Um, you've got maybe um, a, a collection of some identified ideas. How do these small communities then put that into action? So you want to talk about volunteers, right? Is that yeah. where you're at? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it seems like many of these small communities, right? It's the same small group of volunteers that community leaders are consistently relying on to either help raise money or, you know, put on the local festival or community events. And, and many of them are retirees who are getting older, wanting to step back. And, you know, it's not just going to be the baby boomers that are going to carry these small towns in the next 10 to 15 years. So, You've reached out to the community. Maybe you've reached out to younger members. You've got these ideas. How do you put that into action? Where do you, what are the next steps? Well, first of all, you need to know that you do not need another plan. You do not need another committee. You do not need another meeting. And it's not about gathering these ideas to you so that you can hoard them. It's about turning the ability to act over to the people with the ideas, giving them the resources that you have to connect them with whatever it is they need to make their idea happen. If you want to work on beautification in your town and your idea is that we need to have better flowers in the park, then you go to the park and work on them. You invite some friends to join you. You take the tools you need. You don't hold a meeting to talk about join the beautification committee so that we can all then work on the flowers in the park. You need to invite everyone to the park and get to work. Definitely. The, um, in the township of Sterling Radden up in Ontario, they did this giant information night and it's about everything that's available in town, like lessons and sports and special interest groups, everything, community service groups, volunteer opportunities, all of that. And they hold demonstrations and do prize drawings and giveaways. They make it fun. And Vanessa up there told us they did this also, or sorry, Vanessa in Heathcote, Australia did it also. And they call it Join the Crew. And it was extremely successful because it was fun. So instead of serve on our committee, it's look how much fun you're going to have doing adult curling. Pretty cool. Um I was in Webster City as a chamber director, and most Iowans know about RVTV. And the first year, uh, they contacted us and said, okay, we're coming. So plan on a party from noon to midnight and uh, fill up the town and make it all fun. So for any chamber director, 12 hours of creating an event is a bit of madness. So what worked was I didn't create it. I just figured where the spaces were. And I, we went to the community and we said, what do you want to do? One fellow said, I want to have a chili contest, chili cook-off. I'm like, that's a great idea. You're in charge of that. You can go over here. The kids from a church in the county said, we want to do human foosball. To which I said, great idea. You can go right over there. So we worked with the community to let them do the things they wanted to do. And one of the benefits of that is everybody came and they brought their friends too. And it was a fun time because they were doing the things they wanted to do. Not to mention supporting either Iowa or Iowa State, right? Now think <laughs> about that through the old model of how you get things done in a small town. Those kids from the church need to come and make a presentation to the events committee that's part of the uh, entire organization of subcommittees that are in charge of making the whole event run, and they all report to the Chamber of Commerce. So these kids have to come, they have to make their presentation in front of a group of folks who have never heard of human foosball and have no idea how it would even work, and it sounds scary because people might get hurt. And instead of having to go through that process and then justify every single decision about how they wanted to do it and let them make changes to your event, instead of that, Deb just said, okay, here's the space, go do it. And do you see how much energy is sucked out of things in the old way that we're used to doing things through the committee structure? Instead, turn that energy around and put it right back into your community. Stop sucking it out in overhead and structure and bureaucracy and the way we've always done things. And that's not how we do things here. And that idea will never work. Turn all that energy back to the young people who want to have a good time. And I have to point out the liability issue because that's the first thing people say around events. Well, there's liability. We have to get insurance. Actually, 
I help them find a sponsor, a local insurance agent sponsored that one particular event. And it was one of the busiest events. Can I tell you about how much promotion he got for his $500 sponsorship? Huge. Figure out how to make it work. Asking for liability insurance is often just a dodge. So, all right, you've encouraged people to get involved, play a small but meaningful role, you know, shifting away from bureaucracy to focus more on kind of these tiny experiments by lots of people rather than a few big bets made only by a handful of decision makers. But is that sustainable long term? Is it possible to, I guess, institutionalize this without becoming more of a managerial system that maybe turns people off or turns people away? (laughs) <laughs> institutionalize. Oh my gosh. I, I love that you chose that particular word because it's the opposite of everything that I want rural communities to get their hands on. Um, we have rigorously trained so many of our people in rural communities that we have to follow the railroad model that was created in response to the telegraph. And that is where the committee subcommittee structure and the organizational chart comes from. And we are continuing to use this. It is just possible you will believe me when I say better communication tools have come along since the telegraph. We have new ways to communicate with each other and we have new ways to make things work. If you, Tom, want to get together a group of your friends to go um, kayaking this weekend, you are not going to form a committee. You're not sending telegrams. You're not going to break out your manual typewriter and your carbon paper and send around a group letter. You are going to pick up your phone and you are going to group text or message or chat with a whole group of friends and say, kayaks this weekend, everybody in, and they're going to be in. And that, because we have those new tools, we don't need to institutionalize these ways of doing things for the small projects that exist in rural communities. We have to learn ways to deinstitutionalize our thinking so that we can do the things that make the biggest differences in our community. We are burning a lot of our people's energy and willingness to get involved on institutionalizing things in the telegraph era. All right. And we've got uh, another question from um, an audience member. Um, As a service provider, we see a large number of individuals diagnosed with a disability leaving rural communities for larger populated areas because of lack of services. Um, With an aging population in our state and the likelihood of um, age onset disabilities, what can we do to promote increasing the appeal of individuals moving to rural communities? The AARP group has on their website an entire section dedicated to livability resources. And those are your best ways to make your community a little more age friendly, as well as a little more disability friendly. And they address all of these accessibility questions from a very practical standpoint. They have free toolkits that you can download and use in any community anywhere. They are very friendly, very accessible, um, very easy to understand, and any community can pick any of those toolkits to get started, pull some ideas out of, and work on making their community a better fit for people with disabilities, as well as people that are aging. And I'm really glad that this question came up because it's something that we do not talk enough about. And you know, I wanna mention, why don't you just have a coffee and calendars event? Bring your service agencies, your nonprofits together, folks of you that may address that issue, bring them together, uh, offer coffee and bring your calendars and talk about what's on your calendar coming up over the next quarter. I promise you, you are going to have conversations about the things you provide that someone else didn't know about. Tear down the silos, start working together and figure out what it is you do and what you can do together. And again, keep up that list of good things. People are going to hear about the bad things. It's imperative that we talk about the good things and the possibilities and what's available out there. And you as a service agency can lead that charge. It's pretty simple. Offer some coffee. Have people come and visit with you. Okay. Um, So let's say you're like me and you live in Cedar Rapids or you live in the bustling and growing Des Moines Metro. Why should they care about 
saving small towns in this work and how and why should they get involved? You know, I used to be part of a group called Tourism Currents. I helped co-found it a long time ago. Um, and that gave me a lot of focus on the tourism and use of social media and social media marketing in the tourism and travel worlds um, as it was becoming a thing. And that gave me an understanding of the perspective of larger communities, especially when it comes to tourism. And so if there's no other reason that you living in a larger metro community or even a micropolitan up to say 50,000. If you can't think of any other reason that you care about the smaller communities around you, there is an increasing interest in small town tourism. Voters Travel reports that increasingly international travelers are making their first visits to the U.S. happen in small towns. People from big cities are wanting to get out more into rural communities. And we all saw during the pandemic an increasing number of people who wanted to go on the Great American Road Trip, who wanted to get out and experience the quirky and essential character of America. And so within your larger community, you can use the smaller communities around you as a tourism resource. And so you want to learn what is around you so that you can refer people to those communities. It's also for you as an individual, I mentioned Tom, that you and your buddies are gonna go kayaking. That's gonna happen outside of your home city. It's going to happen out in a more rural location where you can get right out into more of a wild river. And you so know, you, you need to know where those small towns are, where you can launch. Deb, what were you throwing in there? Well, Van Buren County is a perfect example. That's not too far from you, Tom. It's the only county without a stoplight, 7,200 people. Twice a year, they get together to have this huge event throughout the whole county. So you can shop at an Amish grocery store. You could go have breakfast with the firemen. You could learn to throw a clay pot. There are so many different things happening in those small towns you're going to want to go check out Van Buren County, not too far from you. And you know what? Many people that go there are staying in the larger towns. That's where they're spending their evenings and often eating at night as well. Regionally, we have to get better at working together. Yeah. Um, so we also... Um... Got a question. Uh, unfortunately, it sounds like uh, audience member lost audio and was wondering if we could um, share more information about um, Save Your Town, uh, the ISU studies that were mentioned and wondering if we could share um, other links with the attendees. Um, I've sent some of those links um, to um, our, our tech person who should be sending those out to the group. Um, let me just take one second here and um, pull up the uh, save your town website and uh, save your share, dot town. <laughs> save your dot town. There we go. And and share that in the chat as well for people who may want to. Uh... And we do offer a weekly newsletter. You'll find that on the homepage. Just sign up for that. There's no cost, and it addresses rural challenges and stories that we hear from other small towns that we love sharing with you. Great. Um, and then um, do you want to say just a little bit more maybe about what people will find on, on the website and tools, resources available there? Absolutely. Um, we have individual videos that address specific concerns like finding more volunteers, retaining your young people, um, the idea friendly method for officials and boards. So all of those kind of things are addressed in videos that range from 30 minutes on down in length. And so they're very accessible, can be shared in your community. Most of those also have an audio only version. So you can listen to it like a podcast on your phone. Um, we also have toolkits that will walk you through an entire project like the tour of empty buildings that Deb developed. It shows you the spreadsheets she developed, the step-by-step -step method that she went through to do that. And was it just four weeks that you <laughs> planned that yeah, whole thing? Yeah, because I didn't know any better, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so there's resources like that to help you learn how to apply these concepts that we've talked about. We do have our free email newsletter that comes to you every week. Deb and I alternate weeks, and so you get to hear our great ideas, stories we've found someplace that we've just been, the latest travel news from Kentucky, the um, places that we'll be speaking, as well as ideas that you can put into action right away to shape a better future for your community. And we will be speaking at the International Economic Development Conference here in Dallas in September. And we're doing an idea-friendly workshop. We're pretty excited about that. So you'll soon hear about how that went as well. And 
the articles on our website too are stories about how things worked and how people are excited with the things they've tried. I think you'll enjoy that portion too. Great. Um, are, are there some examples of small steps that communities have taken that maybe have led to, to, to permanent solutions? Um, Plenty. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Plenty. So I'm going to start with a really tiny one and we'll see where it goes from there. Onslow, Iowa, 200 people. Um, Derek and Sarah wanted to update and they wanted to add to their old, sparse, worn out holiday decorations um, that the city owned. So instead of going and complaining at a town council meeting, they just started on their own. They raise money in small town ways, like, you know, bake sales, trivia nights, that sort of thing. And then together, the locals got together and they welded the frames, they decorated them, and they hung them in the downtown. So they gave themselves an opportunity, instead of being embarrassed about the old ones and complaining about them, they just got together and did something. So now each year, their Christmas decorations are beautiful because they said, we can do this. And they were right. They could do that. I would love to share a similar story from Caldwell, Kansas. This is a town of about, um, I want to say 1,800 people in Caldwell. Um, and they were, one of the big issues they wanted to work on was childcare. There's not enough available childcare in their community. I know that this is a high ranking issue on our survey for people in Iowa as well. So I know the lack of childcare is um, a concern. So what Caldwell did is when I came to their community on a visit, then the businesswoman who worked for the telephone cooperative invited a person from the hospital administration. So she had a hospital administrator there because she had heard that they were having trouble providing enough childcare for their own workers. She brought a person from the school because she knew that the school administrator was also interested in the issue of early childhood, early childhood education and childcare. And so then they also had a representative from a local employer and we just had a conversation. So this is the process called building connections. And here's how it went. My host said to the other people, her name, Jill says, do you know anything about how we could get started with more childcare in this community? The hospital administrator said, we've been able to take some Medicare dollars and use that to provide a handful of daycare slots in our own building for our own workers only. The school administrator said, yes, we're actually looking at doing a bond issue in the next two or three years. And we're looking at adding a childcare facility as a part of leading into our early childhood childcare education facility and curriculum. And the local employer said, man, those sound great. We haven't started anything yet but we'd love to hear how that goes. And I said, you do realize that the Medicare funded slots that are happening at the hospital are a toaster. People are going to go to work there and they're going to get trained in provision of childcare. They're going to be trained in childcare center management and how to follow the state rules within the state that they're in. And then it is like a toaster. They're going to warm up in there and then they're going to pop out and they're going to start child care centers of their own elsewhere in the community. They may go into the schools program that will be developing over the next couple of years. They may start their own facility somewhere else. They may be the kind of person that gets hired by that employer who's looking to start a child care center for their own employees. So you see that having bringing the people together and starting the conversation to build connections allows them to have now kind of a three year outline. I won't say a plan, but a three-year outline of how things may improve in their community, starting with what's happening at the hospital, building on it at the school, and connecting with the local employers. So I guess, are there some key takeaways or maybe um, contributing factors um, to the success that you're seeing in um, some of the small towns and communities that you're working with that, you know, have really... Um, I don't know, turn things around and embrace the, the idea of friendly method? You know, we talk about tearing down the barriers to entry quite a bit, um, making it possible for entrepreneurs um, of all sorts and all kinds and all income levels be able to test their idea out in a small way. That helps create more businesses and get more people involved in the community. 
Um, we do talk about innovative rural business models, things like shared spaces, like what they've done in the village in Washington, Iowa. They had a big department store that was empty for years and they couldn't find a big retail tenant that could fill the whole thing. So finally, a group of women, local women, decided to try something different. They took up 15,000 square feet of that space, divided it into individual storefronts that faced the inside of the building, just like a little village square. And each storefront is only a few hundred square feet. So you could try your idea that the tiny retail businesses can fill them up. Even smaller inside the tiny village square in the center, they have push carts and card tables for the jewelry maker to try out do I have a good product here or even tinier startups? So really you can just start a business idea just on that one table, move up to a push cart, step up to fill a tiny storefront, then graduate to a space of your own in the downtown. There's even a one wall book, one wall bookstore there and it's just shelves on a wall. It's room for all the ideas. And that's just one story of shared spaces that allows the barriers to come down and let everybody try their idea. The reason that letting more people try business ideas matters to the future of your community is first of all, by doing more commerce and doing more commerce together and drawing others in from outside, we're making our community overall more financially prosperous. By having more people involved in business, then we're building better connections between the people of our community. That's building our social capital of bridging social capital between groups that aren't alike, bonding social capital of people who are, are like us. Running a business by definition means thinking from the perspective of an other person. And so by thinking from their perspective, you're getting better insight in what matters to other people. This is helping you to build better connections within your community. Understanding other people is a fundamental first part of building community together. Okay. Well, we've uh, got a little less than 10 minutes um, to go. Um, just a reminder that uh, if you have questions for our panelists um, to please uh, pop that into the, the chat or the Q&A at, at the bottom. Um, if you have an idea for your community, but you're not necessarily sure, uh, I guess, how to proceed or you want the panelists to kind of weigh in, um, again, pop that into the chat and we'll be um, happy to, to, to talk about that. Um, So, um, Deb, tell me a little bit about, uh, I think you mentioned this earlier, the tour of empty buildings. I did. So when I went for an interview in Webster City to be the chamber director, I drove into town and counted 14 empty buildings. It's a town of about 8,000 people. Their major manufacturer had left a couple of years before. Um, the economic development people really tried for years to recruit, recruit a new manufacturer, and that just wasn't working. Plus, a lot of the small businesses had folded that supported this big manufacturer. And everybody was really, oh, poor us, we're never going to be the same again, or save your left. It just wasn't working. And I thought, you know what? There are people out there right now that want to fill those businesses. They want to try their own ideas. They want to try things. So let's try something different. We're going to do a tour of empty buildings. I didn't know what that was going to look like because I made it up, right? But what we did was we've got 12 buildings that agreed to come on the tour. And it just wasn't me doing all the work. Um, the local realtors stepped up. The building owner stepped up and said, yeah, sure, we'll be on the tour. And, and the city manager and a, a construction company walked through a couple of buildings with me just to kind of give me ideas on what kind of work was needed. I wasn't asking them for permission for the tour. <laughs> I just wanted them to see what we were doing and what could be possible. And it got them excited too. Uh, the old boys at the coffee shop. Uh, were adamant that that would never work until I mentioned one fellow's granddaughter that lived in Des Moines. And wouldn't it be great if she could come back to Webster City and start a business? And light bulbs started going off. He got it. So it was involvement with the entire community that helped spread the word and made this possible. Um, we held it, held the tour. 44 people came. That was a success because those 44 people and everybody else in town just kept talking about it. In 18 months, 10 of those 12 buildings were filled. 
tour of empty building works. And, and, and has 18 months and a year and a half. And every time something happened in one of those buildings, a new person came in or the incubator project kicked off, the local media stepped up and took pictures of the new people and put it in the newspaper. I mean, they really got involved in a meaningful way in making these stories be told and be spread. Um, it was so much fun. It was so much fun and everybody really enjoyed it. We saved the local movie theater. I mean, all kinds of things happened in that year and a half from a tour and, of empty buildings. And, and so I'm sorry, how were those buildings filled? By all kinds of people. Some were bought, some were new businesses that came in. There was an incubator project. So uh, two buildings went into that where a business could come in, um, rent, for free for the first three months, reduce rent the rest of the year, and the business paid the um, utilities. And then the chamber helped them with marketing, teaching them about marketing. And a small business development center came and worked with creating business plans for these businesses. So some of them worked, some of them didn't. One woman rented out a building. She ended up buying a building next door, three times as large. And she has since helped three other businesses get started in a similar fashion. It's a great way to try your ideas out. It did not come from recruiting a new manufacturer. Oh, no, no. It was the new businesses plus the existing businesses in town that expanded and helped bring in more people and more jobs as well. Not All a right. new manufacturer. Yeah. Uh, well, this has been um, a fantastic discussion. Unfortunately, um, our time is um, kind of winding down. Um, I wanted to, to, to throw it to the both of you. Uh, I guess any kind of final closing thoughts here? Um, any advice for people who um, feel energized about what, what where they should do from here, what, what they should do next to try maybe some ideas that they might have? Get together with your friends and talk about your big idea. Start talking with your people. What do you want? Go try it. Bring them together. You want to have a new brewery? Hey, go get together with the home brewer, home brewers. See what they're talking about. I mean, it's that simple. Just, just do something. Get in action. When I visited Elkhart, Kansas, there was a woman who told me that it was her dream to see the entire town of Elkhart, which is under 2,000 people. She wanted to have tables right down the middle of Main Street and shut down Main Street so that the whole town came together at these long tables and had this community dinner. I said, that's awesome. How long have you been thinking about that? She said, five years. I said, next week, I want you to get a card table and I want you to go out on the sidewalk in front of your business and I want you to call two friends and I want you to have a picnic and I want you to talk about your dream of the community dinner. And then the next week, I want all of y'all to call your friends, have two card tables, and grow up from there week by week until in five years, or maybe a lot less, you're going to close down Main Street. And you're going to have that entire town coming together as a community right there down the middle of Main Street. People are talking to each other, they're eating, they're enjoying their town, and they're building connections. And it's going to happen because you start, and you start with that card table, and you start next week. Right. Um, well, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Deb Brown and uh, Becky McRae of um, Save Your Town. Um, thank you to our audience for your questions and interest. And again, thank you to our Iowa Ideas sponsor, ITC Midwest. Um, a reminder that tomorrow, my colleague Aaron Murphy, the Gazette's Des Moines Bureau Chief, will moderate a session on creative workforce solutions for urban and rural communities um, with panelist uh, Cassandra Hecker of uh, Suck Up Manufacturing and Aaron uh, Molinix of the Iowa League of Cities. Um, again, that is noon tomorrow, um, and that is on uh, creative workforce solutions. Um, all sessions for the week will be available for replay um, at the end of the week on Friday at www.iowaideas.com. 
And registration is now open for the full Iowa Ideas Conference. Uh, that free virtual conference takes place October 12th to 13th. Um, you can register and learn more at iowaideas.com. Um, again, thank you to our panelists. Um, great discussion. Appreciate your insight and perspective on this. Um, and thank you again to our presenting sponsor, ITC Midwest, and the audience members. Um, thank you so much. Really great time.